Lord, we just uh, pray that you would bless this night. God, we pray that you would bless this time of training. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would just come and fill up this place. We take authority over every work of darkness, anything that's hindering our lives, we come against right now in the name of Jesus. We just declare that Jesus is Lord over this space. Jesus is Lord over our lives. Jesus is Lord over this time. God, we pray that uh, you would bless this time, Lord, and we pray that Shana would have an especially blessed yep. night, God, yes. that Amen. she would experience the blessing of just um, being totally your daughter, Lord, and born again. And Lord, Amen. we pray that as we celebrate her natural birthday, she would have a lot of joy tonight in Jesus' yes. name. Amen. Amen. So tonight is called Purity and Perseverance, and we're doing a slight movement away from the themes that we've been doing the past several weeks because the past several weeks we've been doing these themes of how to deal with objections and we have a, um, a foundation for the gospel but all of that's good and in the future we will go back to those type of things but one of the keys is that you can have all of the knowledge and you can literally know how to share the gospel and you can know how to deal with every objection but that doesn't mean that you'll be consistent in evangelism and it doesn't mean you'll be able to persevere. So in order to continue doing evangelism and to do it successful, you have to ha have purity and perseverance. Otherwise, like as I was thinking about this earlier, you know, it's kind of like the difference between a firecracker and a fire starter. You know, a firecracker is like, it's done, a lot of noise, quick, quick flash, and then nothing. And where, if, you know, you start fires, technically it's like a fire can consume and take over and it can be something that lasts a long time. So God isn't calling us to be firecrackers, fire starters. And there can be this Ooh. temptation. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. It's a good one. It was from the Lord. It was from the Lord. Uh, the temptation that people can fall into is like firecracker evangelism. Like, yeah. Oh man, I got I got a got a good in, and then it's like six months go by, and it's like they didn't they don't share with anybody after that. Uh, so the thing is, you know, the way that you get good is perseverance, and the way that you maintain that is purity. And so it really is the difference between somebody. I'll give you an example. Who here feels like when they watch the Olympics, they want to start doing some of the things that are on the Olympics, even though they have no desire ever. So, for example, every time it's the Olympics, I get into a pool and I'm like, I should get better at swimming. Like, I'm athletic. I should become a good swimmer. And then what ends up happening is like after a month of swimming and chlorine and spending like three hours at the gym because, you know, you try to swim after your workout and it's not the best thing to do that after a workout. You know, it's like, whoops, it's done and I haven't, I haven't, I haven't swam in like three years. <laughs> Except in a lake with tests and that experience wasn't uh, the best because I had waterlogged shoes. So I wasn't, maybe if I had kept swimming for the past three years, I would have been able to handle it. But the point is, you know, it's like the Olympics come and I'm like, yes, I should get in a pool and that would be such a good workout. Like I'm athletic, I could probably be a good swimmer. And then after a month and the Olympics end, it's like back to normal, I'm not in a pool ever. So that's not how God wants us to do evangelism. So what is necessary to succeed? Um, not to burst anyone's bubble, but sometimes people do struggle after evangelism training. So we're going to talk about why that is. Um, I've met a lot of people that have been in the Lord for a long time that know how to share the gospel, but they still really struggle. And I want to ask people, why do you think that is? Why do people struggle, even though they go through training? Why do they struggle? Not enough self-confidence. Okay, not enough self-confidence. What else? Spiritual reality of an enemy coming against you. Spiritual reality of an enemy coming against you. Mm -hmm. Sin. Sin. Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the right words just don't come naturally when you're standing face to face with someone. Okay. Panic. Panic. Do you have one, or that's the one? I was just thinking, um, it's easy to get discouraged if you're not really listening to the Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm -hmm. The passion subsides. The, the initial, you know, passion of, of Christ, you know, kind of wanes, you know, with the day-to-day um, -day living, you know, which you 
question. Yeah, very true. Is this yeah. question just pertaining to those who actually uh, know we're called to do it and want to do it? Or? Yeah. So it's kind of like, what do you think? As opposed to somebody sit thinking that they're not called to do it. Yeah, because yeah. I think I encounter a lot of Christians who think that, oh, mm -hmm. they struggle because they don't want to do it because they think they're not called. Mm -hmm. Discouraged because you don't see fruit. Discouraged because you don't see fruit. That's true. Or if you feel alone. If you feel alone. Or if you just forget why you're talking and you just think you're lying. Mm -hmm. Kind of have like a lapse yeah. where you're like, oh no, what was I saying? You think too many people would you know, make a big, big deal out of it more so? You know, how it's going to be instead of letting it just come? I mean, kind of like having fear. Maybe that's it. It's like they plan ahead, you know, too much instead of just letting what is meant to be to be. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Or constantly comparing yourself to someone else who's doing it. That's true. Yes, yes. Get legalistic. Legalistic. So one big thing is people often come under demonic attack when they begin to step out and make waves in the devil's kingdom. So that's a very big one. Um, that could even be the biggest one. Uh, people often s start to get discouraged when they don't see fruit. And, and then there are even times where people can be evangelizing for the wrong reasons. And that will keep you from succeeding. So we're going to actually deal with... Um, well, what I mean by that, sometimes people evangelize it with the best of intentions, but they're actually kind of doing it to earn their salvation. And if you're doing that... You're not going to really succeed. You're going to get burnt out. Um, then there's other times where people are trying to do it to pay off for their old sins. And that can actually be a big hindrance as well. And so even this is a, a rare one because it's so few people share the gospel. It's like, you know, not that often that people will do this. But people can even sometimes do evangelism uh to avoid dealing with what the Holy Spirit wants to address in their lives. So that's rare, but it is a thing. And it's things that I've experienced and seen firsthand. Uh, that's it for this. What? Uh, we've seen people do it out of pride, counting the numbers. That's true. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a lot of that. Yeah. Traditionally, old style, old school evangelism. It's all about the numbers. I've actually, once upon a time, I had a guy that was part of uh, Campus Crusade before it was called Crew. And this guy was an older gentleman and he was a missionary uh, in other, or you, he did Crew somewhere else and then came back and worked for his father's company. And when we talked and we met, um, he, you know, was saying like, I like your ideas, but you know, you got to have like some kind of numbers to present to people if you want to get funding. And... Um, I was like, well, you know, I just figure the numbers are up to the Lord because, uh, you know, otherwise you start telling people like we've had 10,000 people come to the Lord and it's really like maybe 10 people came to the Lord, you know, because you can get 10,000 people to pray prayers. You know, you can go up to somebody and say, hey, man, pray this with me right now. And they'll be like, OK, like only God haters won't do that. So but it doesn't mean anything to just have somebody do that. Um so a common theme in the book of Acts is that when you try to spread the gospel, the devil seeks to destroy you. So it's the reality of the world we live in. And if it happened to all the disciples who have done things that none of us have ever done and seen things that none of us have ever seen, it's probably fair to say that it's going to happen to us. And we see, I'm not going to share the, the verses because it's just going to be number after number, but Peter and John arrested by the Sadducees, um, questioned by the Sanhedrin and flogged. And then Stephen is arrested by the people, the elders and the scribes. Questioned before the Sanhedrin, stoned to death. And then right after this, there's severe persecution. So it's like the gospel spread. 3,000 were added in Acts 2. And then they began to have incredible signs and wonders and things happening. And then Persecution comes, the devil tries to tamp it down and to shut it down. And we see that Saul, you know, went and imprisoned many Christians. 
Um, we actually see it right after Paul came to Christ and all throughout his ministry, the Jews were constantly plotting to kill him. So he would go to a city, powerful things would happen, and then the Jews would follow him and rile up the city and try to kill him. Um, that happened a lot in the book of Acts. Then there's King Herod. Um, people think it's uh, probably Agrippa the first executes James and imprisons Peter. And so we see like a full rundown in Acts of what happens when you challenge the devil. He comes after you. Paul and Barnabas being driven out of Antioch. Jews and Gentiles attempt to unsuccessfully stone Paul and Barnabas. Jews stone Paul nearly to death. Paul and Silas were flogged and imprisoned by Gentiles in Philippi. Paul and others were chased out of out of successive towns by Jews. Paul is made to appear before the Roman proconsul um, Gallup in Archaea, who, or Archaea, what? That's what it says. Archaea, who dismisses the case as an internal dispute. Worshippers of Artemis and Ephesus ride against Paul and his companions, but they are not harmed. And then in his final journey to Rome, you know, the Jews are constantly trying to kill him along the way until he appeals to Caesar. And um, that's just a clear biblical case for you. If you challenge the devil, he's going to come after you. And when you share the gospel, you're challenging Satan. So, oops. I thought this was a great photo because it's like a thousand arrows. <laughs> Yeah. Galileo. Galileo, okay. I don't know why it said Gallup. Um, when you share the gospel, you know, if you, the way that you can know if you're under attack is when you share the gospel, you begin to see random problems start arising. Like, who here has ever done that or seen that? So, for a quick break, uh, I want maybe people that don't know each other that well. Uh, so, it would be kind of like, Andrew and Adam and Tess and Cody and Lucy, and you, you and Summer, and maybe like you three, share about maybe a, just for a couple minutes, share your experience and in, in you share the gospel and then you notice that you came under attack if you've had that experience, just so that people can kind of relate. So that's going to be for about only, you know, five minutes. So don't share every single detail, but share just some experiences that you've had just so other people can see, oh, it's not just me uh, that goes through this. Every, this happens to everybody. So we're going to do that for four minutes. Twenty-second uh, warning. Twenty-second warning. Twenty second warning. Ten second warning. Okay. Everybody ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So everybody had experiences to share because I'm guessing. Uh, so oftentimes after you do evangelism, you can even have long-term weaknesses that get stirred up. So it's kind of like something that's just buried under that gets stirred up. And that can be anything from sin and temptation to, um, to things like anger, uh, frustration, depression, um, laziness. Like, you know, you take a step forward and then it's like all of a sudden these weaknesses start to come up again and it's because you're under demonic attack. So, like I said, there can be an increase in temptation to sin. Um, the thing that you have to understand is that while we're alive, we're on enemy territory, which is just the God's honest truth. Um, and it's sobering. And it can even freak you out if you let it. But the truth is, God is still God. But we are on enemy territory. This world is not heaven. This world, that's why it says that we're aliens and strangers here in First Peter. Um, we're kind of on our way through the devil's camp to the kingdom of God. 
And while we're here, we're kind of pulling people out of the devil's territory to say, come to the kingdom of God with us. Um, so one of the keys is you have to get used to it. When you're under attack, or you, when you evangelize, like at this point, when we do something, I'm like, I'm kind of like ready. You know, it's almost like if you're in a fight, you know, it's like your arms are up. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. So I'm not going to get caught off guard. If the devil does something, it's like, I'm going to block it. And I'm going to try to punch back too. And you can do that actually by making a determination to not let what happens when you're under attack get you down. To realize, you know, to see it through God's eyes. You know, God doesn't just want us to run and hide. He wants us to overcome through truth. So declare. If you feel under attack after you do ministry, declare it. Say, I'm under attack right now. You know, first thing, speak the truth. And then begin to pray and then share with somebody and ask for for help. But um, the more you get used to it, the more somehow it actually seems like it happens less. So I'll give everybody an example. You know, last day, last day of evangelism, our last three days, um, maybe even three, one of the days I was preaching and I was like preaching up a storm. And I kid you not. I mean, like probably everybody within five or 600 feet could hear me. And I felt like the space was different after that. And then um, there was kind of a place where I felt the devil was trying to rob in the past, you know, in the, right after that, like this good triumph, I felt like some things happened and came in uh, to the space and that we were having to deal with that were trying to rob of the past, the last two days. So there's certain principles. The devil always wants to get you, you know, either coming or going. It's very rare that it happens in the middle because the thing that you remember most is the beginning and the end of something. So the devil will always try to attack at the end or right after because then it leaves you with a really sour taste in your mouth. And this wasn't something that was that sour, but um, at the university, we did worship to end our time there. And we didn't have anything crazy. And then we start worshiping and some guy comes and starts playing a really sacrilegious, secular, like mocking song blasting it towards us and i'm so we go over to him and we're like why are you doing that like there's an entire mall here why are you sitting right here blasting it towards us so you know we actually went and surrounded him in worship and he was like okay like i'll turn off my music uh you guys are free to come surround like it was kind of odd he was like yeah i'll participate with you guys and he turned off his music and we surrounded him and <laughs> we're worshiping but when that happened some guy saw one of the signs that said, uh, pride keeps people from Jesus, and he tried to steal it. The guy on a bike, he, he tried to come through, and we, like, we had no idea what was happening. All of a sudden, Tony had the sign, I see somebody grabbing a bike, and I'm like, what's going on? Yeah, so, um, but the point is, it's like, last day, we're in the middle of worship, the devil was trying to attack, and, um, you know, trying to bother us, so, but, some people maybe that were there, uh, especially those that hadn't ministered you know, with us, maybe felt like a little funny, like, whoa, you know, like this was kind of intense. But the people that have ministered were just like, par for the course, you know, <laughs> par for the course. Of, cor of course this is going to happen. The devil's going to try to do something like this at the end. And so we don't get this. It's like back, back to worship. Don't even think about the guy, yeah. you know, get back to worship. It doesn't yes, matter. Amen. And then we had a great fellowship night that night at Mod Pizza. Um, oh, yes. What? Oh, yeah. The guy thought it was a gay pride bashing sign. And I was like, what is wrong with you? yeah, I said, it has, I said it has nothing to do with homosexuality. We're talking about all pride. We're talking about just pride in general. We're not talking about homosexuality. And so it was just crazy. I was like, you can't steal, steal our sign because you just... You know, you haven't even met us. You haven't even talked to us. But even if they did, you can make another one since we broke them. I know. You have, so, how to get the, have the victory over attack. So, one of the keys is accountability with other people. If you want to overcome what the devil's doing on your own, like, let's go bury your grave all together. We can do it. But if you have other people... Or, you know, dig, dig your grave, bury your grave, wrong, wrong word, dig your grave. But if you want to succeed, you got to have other people in your life. You got to have accountability. 
Because nobody overcomes the devil on their own other than <laughs> Jesus Christ. He's one example in Scripture that we see. But that's the only person that we see. No one else overcomes the devil alone. Um, so you got to have accountability with other people. And what I mean by that is you got to have people that you have intimate enough relationships in your life with that when you do come under attack after doing something, you can declare, I'm under attack. I need help. And um, then God will have you play that role in another person's life as well. Can I say something? What? Um, you may, people may have success with overcoming demons to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but there, there is a demonic hierarchy, mm -hmm. kind of Luciferic hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And then there's principalities and powers. And so there's, we may have success in overcoming certain demonic forces, but Satan can up the ante. And right. He can bring more to bear in situations mm -hmm. than a human being might even understand. Yeah. And sure, if you have the Holy Spirit, that's great, but you better be walking in the middle of God's will. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's true. Very true. Do you think putting on the armor of God would help us? Um, well, the thing is, it's not something that you put on through your words. It's just a choice that you make. Okay. So, you know, people always want to just say the scripture, but you can quote the scripture. And truthfully, it doesn't mean anything if you don't actually do it like you have to do it get people kind of turn to it like uh almost an incantation and it's not an incantation saying i put on the armor of god or you know on the helmet of salvation means nothing if you don't actually put on your salvation and use it to guard your your mind um but you got to have intimate relationships with people so it's hard to do ministry this is why jesus had the 12. um to create a system of accountability and structure for each other. Um, and we could even, we don't know, but in his humanity, he maybe even needed that. Uh, we don't, can't say that for sure, but we know that he did it for a reason. So he was, it's not like he just had the 12 and then would separate himself. He would, lived unified with them. And so there's a reason why that was. It would seem likely that there were times when he surrounded him and protected him. Yeah. So then, you know, it sounds funny, but godly stubbornness, if you want to overcome an attack, you, you kind of have an attitude that says, I'll go three times harder to spit in the devil's eye for his attempt to attack me or, you know, you after uh, serving the Lord. So there's a place for some godly stubbornness. Like if the devil comes to attack you, you get up. If you get thrown down, you say, OK, I'm going to get up and I'm going to fight even harder. Um, and that's the difference between a winner and a loser. And there is a place in Christ where we are called to be winners. It doesn't necessarily mean winners like in the world system, but it means winners against what the devil is trying to do. And, you know, God calls us to succeed more than conquerors, more than overcomers. So a losing mentality is the devil pushes you down and you wait there, you know, for, and you say, you know, I'm not going to get up. But if you have the ability to get up, you stand up in the power of God and you say, man, I'm going to fight again. You know, if I got knocked, uh, you know, like punched in my on the left side, like I'm, if the devil does that again, I'm going to block it. Like I'm, I'm going to try to do whatever it takes to to do better the next time. So that's one of the ways that you have um, overcoming under attack. You can overcome if you have a godly stubbornness that gets up and says, I'm going to push back against whatever is coming against me. So there are a couple principles to understand. What? Come on. There we go. Um, everyone, most everyone has probably heard of or seen the matrix, the idea that, you know, the machines took over humanity and everyone's plugged into a false system. Well, the reason why you know, I put that picture there, if you have any reference, because the Christian life and the life in this world is very much like the light invades the darkness. And we even see that in John 1. You know, it says the light shines into the darkness and the darkness is not overcome it. It's not uh, the darkness has encroached on the light and the light, you know, is uh, keeping, you know, defending from the darkness. It's offense. God is invading the devil's system 
Um, it's not the devil invading God's world. It's God invading the world that has been given over to Satan. And that's an important thing to understand as we're talking about this idea of being under attack. Because, you know, we want to have this idea like everything's just great. And there's even a lot of Christianity that's like, you know, everything's so great. And everything, especially in America, you know, a lot of the bigger ministries, you know, it's like we're going to have the power. We're going to have the wealth. And the problem is the devil doesn't let anybody get the power and the wealth in this system, which is why God will sometimes do incredible things like Daniel you know, he'll show us mercy and grace by maybe giving us a president who's not utterly wicked. Um, and then sometimes God will withhold that grace, I guess. But, um, you know, the truth is that it all comes down to in this kind of reality of life that we're in, that it's God invading the devil's system and world. And so if we look at it through that paradigm and that dynamic, that can help us. So if we feel like we're under attack after serving the Lord, it's like, of course, we're under attack. You know, it, of course, God's not turned his back on us. This is just the world we live in. This is the reality of the world we live in. So when you go on the offense, the devil knows. There is this thing in the Matrix, not to give away the storyline, and the Matrix is not the end all of like analogies, but it's just a good one. Um, the machine world was able is able to kind of like keep track of what's happening in the system it creates. And if um, there are things that are threatening to the system that the machines have created, the machines can pretty much implant themselves or a program into any person that's plugged into the matrix. I don't know if that's making sense, but if you've seen it, you know what I mean? But the point of that is that it's like, Anytime something would happen in the matrix where the good guys are fighting the machines, the machines would take note of it and send reinforcements to try to destroy whatever it is that's threatening them. And that's actually what happens in real warfare. You know, you go into a place um, and uh, in our day and age, you know, often there hasn't been serious warfare between major powers, but like in Iraq, you know, if the insurgents, uh, the people that were fighting the U.S. go and attack a U.S. Out outpost. All of a sudden, like out of nowhere, there'll be a drone or an F-16 that comes and drops a bomb like on wherever the, the terrorists were, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before. And there can be a little bit of that in the Christian life. You know, you fight the devil and then it's like you kind of he knows where you're at, which is why back to what Lynn said, you have to be in the dead center of God's will. Because if you're in the dead center of God's will and you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, God will keep things, what the devil means for evil. Um, you know, he, he won't let it touch you. But that's why the temptation to sin can even occur after uh, ministry and the temptation to maybe respond in sin or to, you know, you have a frustrating situation, you get angry. So it's really important to realize that when you share the gospel, all of these things can kind of happen and they can happen fast. Uh, I think a lot of us here have seen that, that when the devil moves, he, he moves quickly. Now, and the point of sharing this isn't to make anybody fearful. It's just to live responsibly. So, just yeah. We do, everybody has to realize sin makes us extremely vulnerable mm -hmm. to bad things happening. Yeah. To the devil taking advantage. Right. So if we have any sin areas, they have to be brought into submission in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, the devil drawn to that area and he will use it to rip and tear and destroy. Yeah. So should we fear? No. Yeah. Should we be vigilant and responsible? Yes. So after sharing the gospel, one of the best things to do, and we always do this after we share the gospel, we immediately pray. We immediately, all the time. You know, people will give religion a bad, a bad rap because it does deserve it. But there are things to do that religiously... <laughs> You know, so for, you know, for example, wash your dishes religiously, right? Like you don't want your dishes to, to be in the sink for two weeks. Um, you know, water your plants religiously so they don't die in the Tucson heat. Um, after evangelism, you know, or do you drink water? You drink water every single day. When you're thirsty, you drink water. You don't say, you know what? Like, I'll just skip water today. <laughs> So in the same way, after you share the gospel, after you do ministry, after you do evangelism, pray. Literally pray. We do that all the time. 
I mean, we, we do it so much that it's like second nature. Um, even after we're with Christians and ministering to Christians, Tessa and I will pray. Like, we'll pray on our way home. We'll pray for the night. We'll pray against any spirits that could be in operation in anyone's life that we are with. And we all do that. I mean, it's not just Tess and I. So when we're at the university, we're like, we're not, we're not leaving. You know, it's like, okay, everybody, let's all pray. We take authority over demonic uh, works, works of darkness against us. We pray for one another. We pray that God would sanctify us and cleanse us and purify us from all the stuff that maybe we just came in touch with. And we do that everywhere when we do ministry. So first step is you always pray. If you want to overcome a demonic attack or even kind of go on the offense, pray. Fellowship with believers. So, you know, if you're on your own after you do ministry or evangelism, you can kind of somehow you can start to just get into a funny place. And then you can even feel exhausted or overtired, depressed. depressed. Um, but if you're with other people, it helps displace your energy and your mind. And it gives you kind of something to bounce off of as opposed to, you know, in ministry, it's kind of like you're pushing, pushing, pushing. And then, you know, you stop. And then it's like, oh, well, I feel like I'm going here and there's nothing there to push against. And it can kind of be offsetting. But when you have other people, you know, in, in Christ with you, it's kind of like you get to lock together and help one another. So seek the Lord and then be ready. You know, be ready for the for the devil to try to discourage you. And then... It's fine praying before if I know I'm going to be going out. I just ask the Lord to keep me strong and keep giving me the words to say, whom to speak to, and when to speak. Yeah. And then I just keep that in my mind as I'm getting ready and going. Yeah. And I'm just saying, I'm ready to go. You just mm -hmm. keep guiding me when to speak and whom to speak to. Amen. I, the more I lean on the Lord, the easier it is for me just to go up to people. Amen. So then trust in the Lord. All the time. So trust in the Lord when... Yes after you've done ministry. You know, this is a different tangent on this, the light in the days of darkness. Somebody gave me an example once about, has anybody ever gone into a cave? Mm -hmm. And oh, they yes. turned the lights off, it's totally, totally dark. Right. And um, they gave the example of when you're in total darkness, but you turn on even the tiniest little pen light, and it totally invades that darkness and takes over. And I thought that was encouraging because sometimes we think our efforts are so little, so tiny, and mm -hmm. we kind of beat ourselves up and say, why didn't I say this? Why didn't I say mm -hmm. that? And a doubt comes in. And to me, it's just encouraging that no matter how tiny our witness is, God can still use it for our good. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. So the next thing is discouragement. So when you try your best, <laughs> and I thought, great example, you know, dead tree, like <laughs> no fruit. Um, when you try your best and you don't see anything happen, it can get discouraging. So for a couple minutes with the same people as before, share a little bit of your experience where um, you felt discouraged not seeing any fruit from what you were doing. Because that will help the other person think, oh, it's not just me. Andrew, who's a great evangelist, has felt discouraged before. Wenny, who's an evangelist extraordinaire, has felt discouraged before. <laughs> Ready? Ready. Okay. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So we all have experienced discouragement after ministry. And so, you know, all evangelists and all ministers have experienced this. So there's nothing unique to you. And if you have felt even really discouraged at times, you can realize that every single person in the Bible felt pretty discouraged. Moses felt discouraged. He was really sick of the people's attitude. And after everything that he did to, you know, help them uh, and you know, being used by God to do signs and wonders. Uh, Elijah felt discouraged after the prophets of Baal, after he did this incredible feat. He felt discouraged that somehow uh, Jezebel and Ahab, maybe, I guess, you know, weren't ready to give up their false gods. Like maybe he thought the Lord is going to do this and everybody in, the, in Israel is going to come to believe. But 
No, I'm saying maybe he felt this discouraged that, you know, they didn't uh, repent is what I'm saying. You know, thinking that if a sign that great had occurred, like surely anyone with a brain would repent. Because obviously, how did he go from that to discouragement? I mean, to I, doubting. Because he said there's no one else in Israel who prays. Yeah. yeah. Is, it, is it true that Jeremiah didn't see one person who had converted? Uh, well, he had followers. So probably nobody that really was important <laughs> that would have been, that that would have would have altered the course of the nation uh, apparent you know maybe didn't convert but um I think that he told people to to go and surrender to the Babylonians and ask for mercy so people did do that um so he didn't have anybody convert in the sense of, like who he was really speaking to he was speaking to false prophets, and he was speaking to the leaders of Israel. And as far as we know, you know, no one ever did. He had a scribe. Right. So everybody experiences this. And there are times and seasons, because there are literally seasons where, for whatever the reason, it feels like nothing is happening. And we don't know everything happening uh, behind the scenes with what's happening in the world and what God's doing, what the demonic kingdom is up to. But, um, you know, after the last prophet, it says that there is 420 years of silence. You know, in uh, even, you know, the Jews considered like the God was silent. There weren't any, any movements. You had the Maccabees, which was kind of like a movement against... Um, the Greek uh, kind of overlords of the time, the occupation, but there wasn't any kind of like real strong prophetic voice for 420 years, which is, you know, pretty crazy to think. Then we even have the Dark Ages, you know, 500 to 1500. Just imagine a thousand years of history with dead Christianity, well, not even dead, you know, religion, Catholicism, uh, persecuting anybody that was a Christian. So, you know, everybody would be like, man, Lord, what's going on? You know, this is discouraging. But it's not about what we're doing in the natural. Um, and like I, we kind of mentioned, at times the prophets spoke for years and no one responded. There are times where Isaiah spoke, Ezekiel spoke, and nobody responded. So... If you're evangelizing for the wrong reasons, sharing the gospel, uh, you won't be able to, to succeed in sharing the gospel in any way of impact or import. So you actually have to be sharing for the right reasons. We have seen things and been at things where, I'll give you guys an example. There was a place that um, they had a booth set up at a fair and they would just go through and try to get people to pray a prayer. And so they'd get people to pray a prayer, you know, oftentimes without them even knowing what they were praying. And then they would say like, oh, 300 people, you know, came to, gave their life to the Lord. But, um, yeah, it's true. So the thing is, with all of that, is that, uh, you know, it didn't really have the impact. And, of course, we don't know in God's realm of no time and space if 10 years from now somebody sees a verse that they heard. But the point is, like, effective evangelism, if you're going to have it really be effective, you got to do it for the right reasons. And sometimes people, for whatever the reason, they know in their minds that they can't earn their salvation, but in their life, it's like they try to earn their salvation through good deeds and good works. Mm -hmm. And that is something that people that have sincere hearts can be prone to, you know, trying to somehow earn their salvation or fall into that uh, pitfall. So, um, Another example, paying off old sins. You know, there have been people that we've met that have had the craziest past and their life was so full of sin and it's like somewhere they're compul compulsive in sharing the gospel rather than under the even the Holy Spirit. It's like they're so compelled, but it's not because it's the Lord compelling them. There's like something in them where they're running and they're running and they're, it's like they're trying to run their path away from the past and it's like if I do this and I do this and I do this surely I'm truly away from my past but the thing is they've never really gotten free of their past and when people share the gospel like that it will either one um, not really be effective or two it may be effective for a very short season 
and then that person's past or the problems that are never dealt with do follow them and they do come. And uh, when that happens. So um, you talk about um, not trying to earn your salvation. I understand that. But the Bible talks about earning rewards. And I, in my flesh, I mean, I know I, that's probably not what I should be focused on. But in my flesh, that's very appealing, earning rewards. Uh, I mean, the reward may be the experience of seeing the person that you ministered to in heaven and be like, hey, I'm so glad to have them say, you know, so glad you shared the gospel with me. I don't think there's going to really be, I think the idea of rewards is there to explain maybe something much deeper than we can totally understand because we know that there's no hierarchy uh, in terms of God. The Bible says God shows favoritism to no one. And so we're all equally in need of grace. It's the same grace that enables us. So I would think that your experiences in this life, at least the good ones, will follow you into heaven. So for example, when you're in heaven, if you spend your life serving the Lord to the best you can, you're going to feel like your life on earth was well lived. Where, you know, if somebody were to spend it playing video games, watching TV, never telling anyone about Jesus, they're going to still be, if they come, you know, make it to heaven, they're still going to be totally loved by God. They're going to be totally forgiven. They're going to be, they're not going to be like a, you know, less than in the kingdom of God. But the thing is, in terms of what, what they were when they were on earth, it's like, all they're going to be able to do is say like, it was garbage. <laughs> they're not going to be able to, you know, say like, I did anything for the Lord or you, and the varying degrees in between that. So I don't think our rewards are really going to be for us. It's going to be more like we're going to be excited that we serve the Lord, like that we're going to know and, and see finally the reality of who Jesus is, who God is, and the parts of our life that were totally lined up with him um, aren't going to be burned. Like it says, the judgment seat of Christ is going to essentially be when our entire life is put to the test and there'll be wood, say, and hub, wood, hay, and stubble, and then there will be, you know, precious precious gems and gold. Isn't there a Bible verse about you were faithful to the Lord, now I'm going to put you in charge of ten cities or five cities? I mean, isn't that something like that? Yeah. I mean, because it's parable, it it's probably just saying, you know, and there's even a level of that in our lives. So if you're faithful in life, God will... Um, yeah, when he, <laughs> That's interesting. But what's that, Lucy? Yeah. Oh. Uh, what? That scripture again has to be taken in context, mm -hmm. and you can't measure all of scripture by one scripture verse. All of scripture must must interpret the one or two scripture verses that are in question. Yeah. So you have to take the totality of Scripture and apply it, you know, as well to what's being said in a particular verse and not exclude everything and try to just co-opt the verse out of Scripture and say, oh, God's got all these rewards for me in heaven. Yeah. For those souls that are truly surrendered, the greatest reward is to be in a loving um, relationship in service to God. It just yeah. doesn't literally get any better than that. Yeah. So if God didn't want us worrying about possessions on earth, why in heaven's name would he want us worrying about possessions in heaven? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So there can be times... Uh, um, was there... Oh, I was, I was uh, saying that the reward didn't have to be material. It could have been some kind of reward. But I don't know. That's just... Uh, uh, so, because, I mean, I think... Really, even I'd say probably in most, even of our experiences and especially in mine, like I, I don't do any ministry with a mindset of like I'm getting anything out of this, like other than like, it's just awesome to please the Lord. 
you know, like it feels, it's, you feel great when you're serving God and, uh, well, there's the joy of obedience and So yeah. you're not doing it for the reward. You're doing it because you love the Lord, but you get a reward for doing it. Because when you disobey, you have that icky feeling inside that goes, oh man, I disobeyed the Lord. I mean, if you truly love him. And it's almost a hindrance, to be honest with you. It's like I want to just do it for just to serve the Lord, but my flesh, like I said, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this for a reward. So the best thing to do would just be try removing that from your programming and then see how your ministry goes. Um, you know, just be like, I'm getting nothing. The parable, Jesus gave another parable of the uh, workers who who labored in, labored in the vineyard. Yeah, like starting in the morning and then some come at noon and then some come 15 minutes before closing. And it's like, the people are like, what? We get the same? So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, you agreed, you know, pretty much the reward is our salvation and our reward is God himself. So at some level, that's where the issue is. N- nothing that God can give can even compare to him giving of himself. And so to any believer, he gives of himself, which means that you literally have everything. Now, Without getting into super hypotheticals, there could be a level, we don't understand how heaven works and how people, you know, for example, I don't know, it's too much to get into, but somebody that essentially is extremely close to the Lord um, as they die could have a different experience of immediately coming into God's presence as opposed to somebody who's like, believes, but they have all the shame and guilt that they're bringing with them and we don't know how the moment, what the moment of, uh, you know, death is like, um, but obviously, some people approach it more with fullness, you know, and confidence in, in Christ, and other people kind of experience it like, oh man, I can't believe I'm gonna die. Like, I better get right with the Lord. So, my mindset is like, just obey the Lord because that's where life is found. Um, so much scripture talking about denying yourself and following him. Yeah. So, I mean, the gospel has been largely perverted in mm-hmm. our time beyond anything that I can possible. Mm-hmm. And people really need to be careful that people aren't borrowing bits and pieces out of the gospel to really um, misalign its, its intent and what it, the real intention here. The real intention is spiritual transformation. Yeah. It's not acquisition. Right. As a matter of fact, that's why the whole principle is that it's by grace. It's not by attainment. It's by grace. It's Amen. not by acquisition. It's it's um, it's coming into a right relationship with God and then leaving anything after that up to Him. Yeah. Because, you know, we have His promises, eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has it entered into the mind or heart of man. And one of the good things that God has planned. He says things. Does that mean experiences? So you know, we have to get back on okay, topic. Okay. Um, so if any one of these are present, the Holy Spirit won't be present in power. So if this is at work in anybody, and just take, even if you haven't seen all of these different experiences, I've seen all of them, and not one person that I've ever seen where they're trying to earn their salvation or pay off all pay off their sins, uh, or maybe even avoiding dealing with what the Holy Spirit wants to address in their lives. That's something as well. You know, sometimes people that do ministry and even pastors, this is something really for ministers, people that are ministers, they can do ministry to avoid God. And that's like a shame. And you actually see that with people that have had all these scandals in most recent years. Or, you know, they're always like, how did this happen? And it's like, Oh, I just couldn't stop. I needed to serve the Lord. It's like, no, you didn't need to serve the Lord. You needed to to let the Holy Spirit deal with what what needed to be dealt with in your life, not not to you know try to show God that, that how important you are to Him. And I mean, I've seen that even you know from from the top, you know, to low, you, you know, just that you're you're brand new believer. It's like if somebody will not let the Holy Spirit 
do what he wants to do in their heart and their life, like it will hinder their ministry and their witness. Um, and the reason why is because the reason why it will hinder is because it becomes a work of the flesh and the flesh always fails and eventually will fall. So if you're relying on the flesh, you know, people can do it for a season. Like I've seen people where it's like, yeah, you know, they got energy, they got hype, they'll fail. Uh, if, if they're avoiding the Holy Spirit and avoiding letting God do what needs to be done in their life, it will eventually fail. Um, and even worse, it can actually, ministry and even evangelism and things like that can become more ministry because eventually people start to move away from the gospel uh, when this stuff happens. But um, it can become a work of the devil. And one example of that is, you know, when you have people go on campus or somewhere and they're just crazy. I mean, like they're going around preaching hatred, saying God hates everybody, you know, going around just that's their message. God hates, God hates. Well, they're actually hurting the cause of the gospel at this point. And so there, something's going on where they're either trying to earn their salvation, pay off their old sins, or they're not dealing, letting the Holy Spirit deal with them in their life. And when that happens... Um, it can actually, in worst case scenario, become a work of the devil to try to do ministry unto the Lord. And um, I mean, all the all the atrocities all throughout history that were done religiously were done unto the Lord. Uh, and there's more, you know, there's so much to go into. We can't even, you know, the point of the night isn't to go into religious atrocities, but people always, whenever they think, Everybody who's in, you know, a place of ministry, whenever they're doing wrong, usually, unless they're apostate and say, I want nothing to do with Christianity, they're always thinking they're doing something right, where in reality, it's like totally off base. Um, so let's go to the next one. Is this... Oh, okay. Yeah. So one of the things that can, yeah. Question. So uh, some of that I've experienced, and I'm trying to understand if this is one of those categories or if it's a new category. But something that I've experienced before is like seeing someone and thinking like, man, if I don't share the gospel with them, like they might be lost if I don't do it right. Like I don't feel right here right now. Mm -hmm. And then I think what came with that was probably a fear of punishment. So it was probably like a earning salvation or something. But mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you know what category for sure that would fall into. Um, I think that probably is everything okay. Uh, it's up there. Do we need to go to the No. Um, so in that kind of situation, and because I'm recording it, let's try not to like interrupt in the middle of a question. Um, can I add something to yeah. those? Because I had wondered about that too. It's like if you don't warn somebody, um, you know, their blood is upon your hand. That well, the issue is we are all going to miss it. Uh, there have been many times where I felt like the Lord told me to do something and I missed it. And then I try to go back and do it and it's too late. And then there's no point in living with guilt or condemnation. The best thing that you can do at that point is to just pray. There's been times where I felt like God, when that happens, I'll be, I'll just start to pray. I'll say, Lord, if you want me to talk to this person, will you please make it happen? Will you please help me? If there's anything demonic holding me back or anything demonic in their life that's keeping um, me from talking to them. There was a time a couple years ago at a Walmart where I felt like the Lord really wanted me to go up to somebody and I didn't feel like doing it. And I think it was even after an outreach and so I was feeling a little, not burnt out on ministry, just like I want to get into the Walmart and go. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, I want you to talk to this guy. And I waited, you know, the entire time getting all my groceries. And I'm like, is the guy still in the store? And then I was like, God, okay, if you want it to happen, please make it happen. Lord, will you please do it? And then he was near the bananas and I went near the bananas and I just said, uh, hey, this sounds may sound funny, but God told me that he wants me to ask you if you've given your life to Jesus. And the guy grew up Jehovah's Witness, and he was in the Air Force, and he just had a kid, and he did not know the gospel, didn't really familiar with anything. And so I got to share the gospel with him and challenge him, and he said he kind of felt convicted. Um, 
he wasn't at a place where he was ready, but it's like I knew I had obeyed the Lord, but that only happened because I prayed. If I hadn't prayed, I don't think I would have done it. So what you can always do is pray. If it doesn't happen after you pray, just say, okay, Lord, because you don't want the devil messing with you either. You know, every time you see somebody having something, they're going to go to hell if you don't talk to them. That person's going to hell if you don't talk to them. Otherwise, you can live a life where you don't ever have any peace. So the pow most powerful ministry is when it's in God's timing. So there are times when it's just not the right time to talk. So, for example, if there's times where Tess and I, we have set aside time where we're like taking a walk unless the Lord brings somebody to us. You know, we pass people on the path and we're not trying to talk to them because uh, we don't want to, to maybe throw ourselves out of God's timing. Yeah. So God will give you peace when it's of Him. And when it feels like pressure and condemnation, it's not going to be of Him. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's been a big difference for us. Absolutely. God has to be bigger than your missing one thing. God makes it happen when it needs to happen. God reaches out to that person multiple times throughout their life. Mm -hmm. So, like, you would have just been one opportunity out of many that you missed out. Mm -hmm. Siva. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that part where you said that God will give you peace when it's a time of pressure and condemnation. Um, as far as, like, well, especially if you feel like you have to share with everyone or whatever, we only have a limited time on this earth and every day. So, it's like you cannot physically be talking to every single person you pass. It has to, you have to be selective. Yeah. So, and even Jesus, every, everyone that came to Jesus, he dealt with, but Jesus didn't go to everybody. So that's something to think about. You know, it says that anyone that came to him for healing, he healed. But Jesus did not go every single place, healing every single person and talking to every single person because he was on an agenda, which was the father's agenda. You have a thought? That is Old Testament, number one. Number two, it's a different covenant. Number three, it's making points about being accountable, the watchman at the wall, and all those different stuff like that. And um, sin is forgivable. As a Christian, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So the whole idea that I'm going to be guilty of somebody going to hell forever, that God's going to judge somebody not according to their their character and their, their actions, but according to whether I witness to them or not, that's just really, really out there. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, um, you know, people will be judged, like it says, it's appointed unto me, I must to die, and then the judgment talks about how we'll all give account for deeds done in the body. So, but if you're a Christian, the deeds, your failings will be covered by the blood. Yeah. So there's no way you're going to be guilty of somebody going to hell. Amen. But one last thought is that um, it's like everything with grace. Um, we, we shouldn't cheapen grace and take advantage of it not to do what God's asking us to. Mm -hmm. So you don't use it as an excuse. Mm -hmm. But if you fail, you know that, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Yeah. Give our sins. One last thought, I'm sorry. One last thought is it's far better to witness to people out of love for God than fear that God's going to judge you with blood guiltiness. Amen. Because you fail to judge. Fear will paralyze you. Love yeah. will expand you. So. That's the main weapon of the devil. Right. So you don't want to evangelize out of fear. Um. So sometimes people live with guilt from their past and they feel that they must share the gospel to make up for their past. And it's not wrong to have a paradigm shift where you see your past and you're like, that was such garbage. I don't want to waste any more time. Um, but you don't want to be sharing the gospel as an escape from your past. So the past can be something that can be like a slingshot where you're like, Gosh, I wasted so much time. I'm done wasting time. I'm going to serve the Lord. But you don't want it to be like, oh my gosh, my past is following me. It's like chasing me. You know, it's almost like having it chained to you and you're, you're running. And it's like, let me run and tell this person about the gospel. Oh, the past is still following me. Let me run over here. You know, it's kind of, and it sounds funny, but, you know, people live their lives like that. And sometimes Christians in ministry live their lives like that. Um, so it becomes salvation by works. Yeah. 
So love and obedience are the highest motivations. So, you know, you obey because you love, love, that shows uh, your love, sh- you know, results in obedience. Want me to go back? Yes. Love is always greater. So even in overcoming sin, like you don't overcome sin by saying, ah, oh, I, I fear what God would do to me. Truly, that can be a good starting point, but you overcome sin ultimately by realizing, gosh, just God doesn't want me to do this. And I love God and I love is going to be the thing that, enables me to stop this and God's love is going to be the thing that enables me to stop this. That's the difference between relationships and religion. Yeah. So evangelizing for the wrong reasons. Salvation comes by grace through faith and we don't share to earn our salvation. We share because we are saved. So you don't share to get saved. You share because you are saved. Anyone that lives lives under condemnation may try to evangelize to appease that condemnation. Sharing the gospel is meant to be to be overflow out of what Jesus has already done in you. So that's the best ministry when it's overflowing out of you and you're able to, instead of it being like, you know, you're a desert ground and you're trying to like dig a hundred feet and to get like a cup of water to give to somebody else. You want it to be overflow out of what Jesus has done in you. Sometimes people um, that have been in a groove of sharing the gospel um, for a long time, it's easy for them. It's so easy for them that they can actually do it to avoid other things. So I know that's not the norm. Like people, some people here that haven't shared the gospel a lot are thinking, what people that can just share the gospel so easily that they do it to avoid God? But we've actually met and been with people, you know, it's like, it was like a one, a one line or a one track ability to evangelize, but they were never able to go deeper in, in their own relationship with the Lord. Um, And usually this kind of evangelism is more centered on the person than on Jesus Christ. So when it's more about a person's ability to share than about the Jesus that they're sharing, that's a problem. And truthfully, it has little to no impact. So what is necessary to succeed? Purity. Purity is key. A commitment to the gospel. You have to have a commitment to the gospel. A commitment to holiness. A commitment to a life led by the Holy Spirit. God is the one that makes something successful when it comes to spiritual things. So without God, there is no success when it comes to spiritual things. Um, And that's very humbling. So it means you can be doing all the right things but still not be successful if God's not in the picture. Things can even have Christian principles, but... Be devoid of the spirit. But if it's devoid of the spirit, it will still be powerless. Again, very humbling. Christian principles, but devoid of the spirit, it will be powerless. And we see that with televangelism and, you know, huge churches and mega churches and compromise. They got all the structure. They even got a lot of word, but they don't have any of the spirit really leading things. And so it leads to powerlessness. So what else is necessary to succeed? Oh, I think it accidentally, yeah, it accidentally uh, duplicated. People. So you have to be around other people. If you're going to succeed, you have to have people in your life. You have to have, you have to share your questions with other people. You have to... Share your experience with other people. You have to share your failures with other people. And the reason why that is, is because to succeed, you have to have a group of people that are committed to seeing you get better at evangelism and vice versa. You know, there's a reason all pretty much everybody that gets better in sports gets better because they play against other people. Um, even in solo, solo events like tennis, you know, the person doesn't get good by just hitting up, hitting against the wall. Like, okay, because then they're only able to deal with their own skill level. They play against people. They have other people. They train with people. So though in evangelism, we're not training against each other. Um, the way that you get better 
is through being around other people. And it's impossible without having people in your life. Like no one will get good at evangelism. No one will even get good at ministry. Nothing in this world comes about without a team, which is very interesting. So politics, you know, nobody gets into politics and makes it to the top without having a team. No one runs a campaign by themselves. Business. Uh, it's not just Jeff Bezos. He's got like probably 30 people that are super good at what they do for each one. And then they all have their teams. And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's built on people like Stephen. <laughs> and Dean, that's true. And then invention. So even the person with the idea for an invention, they don't have the means to produce it. They have to go to people to produce it and to, to finance it. And then, uh, you know, most people don't have all the materials laying in their backyard. They have to go to people that have metal or plastic and all of these different things. So without committed Christians coming alongside you, you will fail. And that's something to really understand. So if you want to succeed, you got to have committed Christians alongside of you. Let's go to the next slide. Computer, why are you doing this tonight? The devil doesn't want this getting out there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what is necessary to succeed? Purity. So people and purity. Purity of life, message, thought, and spirit. The moment you compromise on doctrine is the moment that you're also going to, to fail. So it's, you know, we, everybody likes to feel like there's wiggle room, but truthfully... There's not wiggle room. If you begin preaching a different gospel, you're going to fail. Like, it's just, it's not going to, not going to work. God's not going to back it. And if you got the devil backing you, now you're, you're really in trouble. Because like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, obviously, they got something powering them behind the scenes. And it's not God, because we know that it's not God. Yeah, and various movements in Christianity. So I've never seen one person or ministry continue to share the gospel um, without having purity. And that's in, in my, all my experience. So common pitfalls. I'll give you guys some example. Word faith, you know, the moment somebody starts getting into word faith, uh, and it's not even that all the principles are like bad or evil. It's just the entire movement is so corrupt and skewed. I've never met somebody that shares the gospel really well that, you know, was, doing word faith principles. Um, what? what? Word, word faith. faith, it's like name it and claim it. Uh, it's Either prosperity it. gospel. Um, it's... Yeah. It's kind of like <laughs> living with a, or a faith that's all about self. That So, you know, it would be like God's going to give me a hundred people to baptize tonight, you know, the, and I have faith the Lord's going to do it. But it's kind of supplanting the picking up your cross and following Jesus with inheriting the blessings of Abraham. Yeah. So we try to go back to the old Testament and we're in Jewish tradition. Having wealth is a sign of favor of God. Whereas um, if that were the case, then how do we account for all the disciples? Yeah. Somebody could pick out that thing where Jesus said, whoever follows me will have lands and whatever, a hundred times this and that. Which one of the disciples had that? Right. So again, scripture can be twisted. Scripture can be perverted. God makes provision. Um, he gives us what he chooses to, and he will meet our needs according to his riches and glory. It doesn't say in that verse, he will meet all our wants according to his uh, riches. Amen. And so... Uh, Then there's dead Reformed Christianity. That's kind of one. Now, there are Reformed people that are doing stuff. Like, Ray Comfort is Reformed. So that's why I mean dead Reformed Christianity. I don't, because the overarching Reformed Christianity is so big. But anyone that's like sold out 
to John Calvin is not going to do a good job <laughs> at evangelizing. But people that hold to reformed doctrine, that doesn't discount them. It just may hinder them at times from dealing with maybe more spiritual issues like um, dealing with demons or spiritual warfare. Um, but there are people, you know, where it's just like dead reformed Christianity, where it's all about the mind instead of the heart. And the gospel deals with the heart. Um, and the danger with Reformation Christianity is that it's all about system, systematic theology and all of that's of the mind. So it's not bad. It just it can be a dangerous pitfall because you get into this never-ending mind thing. Um, so charismania, not necessarily charismatic, but charismania. Like people, because, you know, we all believe uh, in the gifts of the Spirit here. But the thing is, like I've been with people that have gone up and like the, the silliest things happen. You know, they'll go up and they'll prophesy over somebody. All of this nonsense and baloney without ever asking them a question. And then I go up and I talk to them after. And I'm like, hey, what did you think of that guy? What that guy shared? Oh, it's cool. Hey, are you open to Jesus at all? Oh, no, man, not at all. What were you raised, Christian? But I think oh, it's all BS now and this and that. So, you know, the guy goes and prophesies and he's like, yeah, man, God's going to give you a master's degree. And you're really creative, and God's going to do all this incredible stuff, and I can just see it on you. And he's like, isn't that awesome? And the guy's like, yeah, man, that's cool. And then he goes away and does it to the next person. And then I'm like, well, I want to see if this is really the Lord, right? Like, put things to the test. Oh, man, this guy is demonized. Like, this guy hates, hates the gospel, thinks every way, you know, he's going to get to God. That guy's prophecy meant nothing. So there is a level of that or... Um, Gold yeah. dust. Gold and dust. Then jewels falling down. Yeah. <laughs> Gold fillings in your mouth. Yeah, but as soon as you start putting the focus on those type of things, like you're in trouble. I've never and I, I you know, I've been around the people, I've seen it, been none of, no none of them can share the gospel. And usually when people start putting their focus on the, that type of thing, there's like serious things in the background. I knew somebody once that was a worship leader, struggled with homosexuality, um, homosexual desire, didn't tell anybody. Like the Lord kind of gave me a word of knowledge. Uh, and you. Um, well, it actually happened. In the, long story, you know, long story. Okay, yeah. Nevertheless, he's leading worship. He, leading worship, and leading ministry, and mind was defiled. And yet he was into all the charismania. Like, he, you know, been slain in the spirit maybe a hundred times, all of this stuff, but he wasn't able to to really be in the purity of the Lord. So then there are, another pitfall can be extreme holiness Pentecostalism, not just Pentecostalism, but the type of people that literally are like somebody here. Oh, so <laughs> Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> We got it wrong. The Passover was now. No, I'm just joking. We love to see. Yeah. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> and um, so what I mean with those type of movements, extreme holiness, Pentecostalism, it's like the Jesus only type people uh, that, you know, den Trinity deniers. I don't know. I've just never met anybody that's really good at sharing the gospel, uh, that even shares the gospel. You know, they're really willing to defend like, oh, you believe in the Trinity. Like that's, you know, crazy that you believe. But they're never really out there sharing the gospel. So the extreme holiness Pentecostalism falls into religious, uh, usually religion, because it's like, oh, women can't wear makeup. Uh, women can't cut their hair. Men have to wear suits to church. And it's like they put all their focus on this stuff. And so when they're out in the world, they're not sharing the gospel. Like they can barely, it, they're sharing the law. Yeah. Religious bondage. Yeah. And the hyper charismatic or word based stuff is in um, deceptive doctrines and doctrines of demons. Yeah. And so the moment you compromise with that type of stuff, it nullifies true power. And the true power of God is not uh, a an imagination. Like in our because of everything with YouTube and all of the, the world that we're in these days, there's like imaginative power of God, but it doesn't have any, any bearing on the real boots on the ground, like deal with people. 
Like when you start dealing with people, you got to have the power of God. Like if you don't have the power of God, you're in trouble and it's not going to be successful. So God doesn't want us to have any compromise. We have to have purity. Um, one of the other examples, so love movements, there's like Bethel and Hillsong and all of that, uh, you know, seeker friendly stuff. People get in, involved in all of this and they don't change. Like I've met, you know, people that will say, you just got to love people, you know, to the Lord. Well, they'll do that for like three months and that's what will end up happening is there's no consistent evangelism after that and they'll never challenge anybody about sin and they'll never really see anybody change. Um, so all of it's so important. Anything that compromises on homosexuality and abortion, like the moment you compromise on that, you're in trouble. Like if you got, if you try to go and evangelize, God's not going to back it. Um, and it's why, I mean, I've never met anybody actively doing, you know, evangelism that has compromised on those things. But people that have compromised on those things, they're not even able to do evangelism anymore if they have compromised. David, that's yeah. to the um, love thing with the Hillsong and Bethel. I'm a little confused about that because um, I don't know much about it, but I've heard there was a problem with them, and I don't know Whoops. whether we should be singing their music. There was some um, controversy about that. With uh, Hillsong and Bethel? Um, so that's a great question. Pretty much any Hillsong music that's newer. So I, in the 90s, a lot of the music that we've all been exposed to was produced by Hillsong. And I think if you look at the words, the lyrics, and the people that were composing the music, like they were definitely under a different spirit than some of the newer people. Like, um, it's kind of one of those things where, so for example, if there's a worship leader 15 years ago that wrote Mighty to Save, um, I don't even know if that person is still involved with Hillsong, but for whatever the reason, it's like, you know, lyrically, there's nothing wrong there. Uh, if somebody were to show me like that a worship leader went apostate, like there's been worship leaders, more recent worship leaders in Hillsong that have gone apostate. And it's like, I... Even if they wrote a good song, I would say I wouldn't want to okay, sing it. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. So Can I say, yeah. There might have been a, a point where God was bearing good things, and God will bear thing, good things up to a particular point. Yeah. Even with ministries that have have um, failed, like Jimmy Swaggart back in the nineties and. Uh, you know, God seemed to bear, bear, bears a very long time with things, undoubtedly um, seeking to, to hope, uh, desiring to persuade hearts to be changed and come into alignment with them. So uh, because of God's forbearance, there may have been a period in some of these ministries where these people hadn't crossed the line with God um, and become moved into, you know, a, more of an agreement with the spirit yeah. of apostasy. We can share more about that after, okay. just because we're almost done. Okay. Um, so in 17 years of living for Jesus, I would say the biggest key to good ministry and evangelism is purity. Purity must be guarded, and the way that you guard purity is by hating compromise. There's a place for hatred in the Christian life. you got to hate what God hates. God hates compromise. And you must not compromise knowingly or unknowingly. It's important to guard our that we play an active role in guarding our lives from compromise. The Lord, truthfully, is always there speaking the truth to us. We just have to see it and have the eyes to see. It's almost like every lie, there's almost, I don't, it sounds like a funny thing to say, but it seems that there can almost be a rule to this reality that if you have your eyes wide open enough, you can always see the lie right in front of you. Uh, the reason why people don't see the lie is because they want to be deceived somewhere. And... That's the danger, but um, God pulls us, you know, his desire to pull us out of deception. So you have to depart from habitual sin. And, you know, oftentimes for people in our day and age, sexual sin, but bad mindsets can be habitual sin. If you want to be successful in evangelism, you got to break out of bad mindsets. You got to break out of bad habits uh, like laziness and, um, you know, even going to food, you know, 
um, as your comforter, you know, your soul kind of like dependency in times of need. That's a bad habit. If you're going to be successful in evangelism and ministry, those are things that have to be broken. Or secular movies. Secular movies, yeah. Right. Secular programming. It's like that kind of stuff's got to go if you're going to be successful in ministry. And, depre- you know, even uh, rejecting depression, rejecting anxiety, rejecting fear, all of that is necessary. So this is why a group is essential. If you have a group of accountability, it will help you if you get close to compromise. The moment you start to compromise, if you have people that love you, they'll say, hey, you're kind of getting close to the edge there. Let's pull you way back over here with us. And then if they ever get in close to the edge, you can say, hey, I love you. I don't want you to get close to the edge. Let's go back over here. Um, and they can help you fight and fight for you in the midst of spiritual warfare. And when you feel like you failed, they can lift you up and you can do the same for them. Uh, it should say same for them, not or them. But praise the Lord. I'm going to close. Lord, we thank you, God, for this time. We thank you for this training. Lord, we pray that you would just fill us all tonight, God, and that you would bless this next part as we celebrate Shana. Help her to get some joy and some life and some smiles going, Lord. And we just pray that you would bless everybody tonight, Lord. Anyone that needs to leave, bless the ride home. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.